Jonah's prayer in chapter 2 can teach us a lot about our relationship with God. Um, all of chapter 2 is really one long prayer, and so I want to kind of walk through that with you and um, just give some thoughts about um, the overall outline and the progression of how Jonah prays to God. In uh, Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we read, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord God from inside the fish. He said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard my prayer. Now, this is the first time Jonah prays from inside the fish. He hasn't prayed yet so far in the book. The sailors asked him to pray during the storm, but for whatever reason, he wasn't ready to pray at that point. But now he turns to prayer as a last resort. We should really see this prayer as a prayer of affliction, not a prayer of affection. Meaning that he, he did this prayer. It wasn't born out of a, uh, it, wasn't a con it was not a conversation born out of love and affection for God. This was a prayer that was more so an emergency button in the middle of his affliction. And we see the same behavior all the time, everywhere. Um, we can see it in the story Jesus told about the prodigal son, the two sons. Right, The, the runaway brother, the younger one, had the same behavior here. Uh, it wasn't until he had reached bottom and he was eating from the trough and living with the pigs that he finally decided he wanted to come back home to the father. As long as he felt like he had options, even though the options were funded by the father's money, but as long as he felt like he had options, he wasn't quite ready to, to go home yet. Uh, we could find examples of this everywhere, although we probably don't need to look any further than your life and my life. We, we have all done this, just use prayer as an emergency button. Uh, I would say to some extent, God actually expects it. So I don't say this to, to make anyone feel guilty or ashamed, um, because really in one way or another, every one of us comes to God because we either want something or we need something. It's the reason we come to him. Sure, we develop a loving relationship over time, but really we come to God because we want something or we need something from him. And again, I don't say that to make us feel bad. I would actually say that God designed it to be that way. It was his idea. He made us and he made us very needy. That's what it means to be human. We're sinful and we're needy creatures. Uh, what he wants us to do is have those needs filled by him. The same way a parent wants to fill the needs of their children. God wants us to come to him for help and for comfort and peace. Of course, he'd rather not that not be the only time that we come to him. Sure, communication is good for every relationship, including the one we have with God. Um, but don't feel too bad by using prayer as an emergency button. Um, I would say emergency prayers are better than no prayers at all. Absolutely. Emergency prayers are better than no prayers at all. Perhaps an altogether better question would be, how can I use prayer or how can my ongoing conversation with God enhance my relationship with him? How can I communicate with the God whose heart is attached to mine and make that relationship even better? Moving on in verse 3, we read, You threw me into the ocean depths. I sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. At this point, Jonah is accepting the discipline that God has for him. Accepting the discipline, which is different than punishment. And the, the distinction really matters. Punishment is strictly punitive. That's it. It has no redeeming value to it at all. Discipline is for disciples, and disciples are there to learn and grow. God disciplines his disciples. He doesn't punish them. Often Christians will cry out in the midst of a storm, why God, why, or what did I do to deserve this? But that's really coming from a place where you're assuming that you're being punished. God doesn't punish those he loves. He disciplines them to teach us. And so an altogether better, better question would be, what can I learn from this? What can, I, what can I become? How can I learn and move on? So what was Jonah's lesson here? If God is disciplining him, what is he trying to teach him inside that fish, that dark, smelly fish? Well, if we stick with the theme of the book, we remember that God wants Jonah to learn what it's like to be weak and powerless and without options. I say that because the point of this is, is God sent Jonah to Nineveh so that people who are weak and powerless with, and without options would be saved, whether it be the citizens of Nineveh that are being abused by their cruel government or the citizens of the countries that Nineveh conquers. They're, they're, they're um, in the minority. They're abused, and they don't have any options. And God sent Jonah to help them. And I think part of the reason Jonah was so reluctant to do that was because Jonah didn't know what it felt like to be weak and powerless. He had never been in their shoes, and so he had no compassion for Nineveh. He didn't know what it felt to be weak and powerless. But he's learning. He's learning in this fish because Jonah has nowhere to go. And there's nothing he can do to, to improve his situation. We'll get back to that here at the end of the message in a minute. But I'm sure you've noticed as well that the people who have walked through pain and fire and poverty and strife and difficulty, those are the ones who make the best caregivers, the best counselors, the best ministers and missionaries. Right? When, when the bottom falls out of your life, they're the ones you want to turn to. You don't want to go to someone who's born with a silver 
spoon in their mouth and they wake up every day and the squirrels iron their pants and the birds make them orange juice, right? You don't want those people in your life when you're at the bottom. You want someone who's got scars and they're battle-worn and they can say with integrity, God, I know how you're hurting because I've, I've been there. I have. God is making Jonah into that kind of a person. We keep reading verses 4 through 7. Jonah says, Then I said, O Lord, you have driven me from your presence, yet I will look once more toward your holy temple. I sank beneath the waves, and the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. I sank down to the very roots of the mountains. I was imprisoned in the earth, whose gates locked shut forever. But you, O Lord my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord, and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Jonah now moves on to trusting in God's promises. Uh, he's been going down throughout the entire book so far. If you look from the very beginning of the book when God or Jonah first turned his back on God's command, the only word used to describe Jonah's movement has been down. He went down to Joppa. He went down into the, the hold of the boat. Uh, he went down to the bottom of the mountains. The lesson here is that when we turn our back on God, down is the only way we can go. And Jonah's doing that. And he finally hits the bottom and decides all he has left to do is look up. And that's what he means when he says, I, I look towards your temple. Everything about Solomon's temple that he built was, was designed to make your gaze go up towards the heavens. So Jonah is, is meaning that when he says, I looked up towards your temple. But in verse 7, he says, I remembered the Lord. What does he mean by that? It means that Jonah is saying that I am now going to, again, act on the basis of your commitment to me. To remember the Lord doesn't mean you forgot about him necessarily. It means I am again going to act on the basis of your commitment to me. Jonah remembered who, his, who he really was. He remembered his true identity. As if to say, I'm a child of God, and that comes with certain privileges. God promised to be committed to my good and to my welfare, and I'm acting on the basis of that commitment. It's the same way you would tell your child, like, you're a part of this family, and you have value and you belong, and so stand up. Walk tall and go forth, loved and protected. God wants us to feel that way as a part of his family, and Jonah is realizing that. He's remembering that at the very bottom of the ocean. So he moves on now in verses 8 and 9. He says, Those who worship idols will turn their back on all of God's mercies. But I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill my vows. For my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Alas, Jonah is now yielding to God's will. He admits, if you notice, the presence of idols in his life. Idols draw our love and affection away from God and give it to something else. Uh, earlier in the series, in parts 3 and 6, we covered Jonah's idols. Uh, his most dominating, most controlling idol was that intense, unbalanced patriotism. He didn't just love his country as I do and you do. Uh, he worshipped his country and turned it into an idol so that his country was more important to him than anything else. Now Jonah is pledging to leave those idols behind and instead honor his vows to God. He's renewing his commitment. And we shouldn't see this as a one-and-done statement. Right? Renewing your vows of commitment can be wise and powerful from time to time. As long as you mean it, of course. Because when we renew our, our commitment, when we renew our vows, it's a way of saying, through the messiness of life and through my tendency to wander, I think I've forgotten my first love. Or maybe I haven't been as intentional and as engaged as my first love deserves. And so I want to remind myself and I want to remind you that my commitment endures. I'm still here and I want to be the best version of myself for you. That's what it means to renew your commitment. That's what Jonah's doing here at the bottom of the ocean. And we have no reason to think he's not trying to be sincere. Last and most importantly, he ends his prayer by quoting scripture. When he says salvation comes only from the Lord, he's quoting Psalm chapter 3, verse 8. Which, if you remember, that's the theme of the book. That's the theme of the entire Bible, is that salvation only comes to us because God loves us enough to pursue us. Uh, Jonah was sinking to the bottom of the ocean. He was completely helpless and unable to improve his position in any way. He only lived because God intervened. That's it. Salvation came only from the Lord. It's also worth noting, as we wrap up here, that Jonah's ability to quote Scripture from memory when he couldn't see, he didn't have access to anything. His ability to quote scripture from memory was the only light of hope he had to cling to. It's a good argument to hide God's word in your heart and spend some time memorizing scripture. He was in an otherwise dark and hopeless situation. His only hope came from memorizing scripture and quoting it back to God, acting on the basis of God's commitment to him. So to sum it up here, in summary at the end, we can see Jonah's prayer as a model for our 
our life, especially when we're going through the storms of life. We can ask God for help, acknowledging how much we need him to see us through. We can accept the discipline he's giving and, and do our best to emerge better instead of bitter. We can trust the promises God made to us, acting on the basis of his commitment to us, clinging to our identity as a loved, protected child of God. And we can finally yield to God, uh, yield to his plan for our life by renewing our commitment to love and serve the God whose heart is attached to ours. Thanks. I appreciate you tuning in. God bless you.